We're at the International Arctic Social Sciences Conference in Akureyri, Iceland, and we're talking to Dr. Sven Harkinson of the Aleut Museum in Kodiak. Dr. Harkinson, you talk about re repatriating traditional knowledge. Can you give us an idea of what that's about? Well, well, first of all, it's, it's a real privilege and honor for me to be able to present here um, and to share what we've been doing through the Aleutic Museum in terms of what we've, what I've come to term repatriating knowledge. Um, we've been working with uh, elders, we're museum collections, um, we've been documenting our language, we've been documenting um, pretty much everything that has been lost. What we've been doing is trying to take knowledge that was taken out and put it back into a living context, back in our community. Uh, for example, we've uh, been working on documenting our language uh, for the last 10 years where we've got um, elders speaking common, everyday language. And one of the issues is we've been trying to record as much as possible because we have um, less than 24 fluent speakers left today. Um, in the last 10 years, we've lost 25. And so it's been a real challenge for us to try to maintain our language, but also try to preserve it. And so what we've been doing is using digital recordings um, and recording as much as possible for our language. Uh, another part is um, uh, we've been going to museums around the world. There's multiple collections in St. Petersburg, in Russia, in Finland, in Germany, in Spain, of uh, collections from Kodiak from the 1800s. And so what we'll do is we'll go photograph that learn how that was made, and then come back, and then we'll go out and work in the, each of the villages um, and share that knowledge, working with the elders, artisans, um, and photographs, teaching, basket weaving, kayak making, hunting tools, bentwood bowls, uh, fishkin sewing. And in this process, uh, we've been able to not, not only start to build on it, but we're putting the information back into a living context. Um, myself, I grew up not knowing much about my culture, not knowing who we were in terms of our 7,500 years of history and what it really meant. And so by being able to repatriate that knowledge or put the knowledge back into a living context, um, we've been able to share with our, our future um, the history, the hands-on knowledge, uh, living knowledge of how our ancestors lived for the last 7,500 years. And with that, we're hopefully we'll continue for the next century building that knowledge, putting it back into a context where it becomes common, commonplace knowledge instead of museum knowledge where it's inaccessible. And so we've basically used the museum, the Lutic Museum, as a tool to try to change um, a lot of the things that had already been changed in the past. In repatriating knowledge, there's also an implicit transfer of knowledge about sustainable environment. Can you explain how that works? For example, when we're um, teaching or documenting the language um, or teaching uh, hunting tools, uh, there's a lot of implicit knowledge that's taught. For example, when you go out hunting, it's, you know, I grew up where you don't take more than what you need. And a lot of our kids, the younger generation, are, aren't being taught that. But then when you're teaching them about hunting tools and about taking an animal, it's more about the animal giving itself to you. And so you start to teach a different philosophy in, in how you harvest your food. Um, you know, fishing is the same way, where you don't take more than what you really need for that year. And so, in a way, it, it's, um, it starts to change the current generation's attitudes about over-harvesting, about exploitation. Um, for example, the museum's logo, you have the, the hands where it's a hole in it. And that's uh, a Yupik uh, tradition where Sedna comes, she takes the animals, and the animal spirits that go through her philosophy is she takes the animal spirits, but she allows enough animal spirits to go through for humans to sustain themselves. I mean, for me, we have a petroglyph that's a thousand years old that has a hole in its hand. And I look at that and I'm like, okay, this is very symbolic of don't take more than what you need so our future can sustain themselves. And in that, with that philosophy, you start to um, really think differently about 
you know, over harvesting your food because you start thinking about, okay, what's going to be left for the future? How concerned are you about the future? Um, well, I, be I belong to the Sukhbit people in Kodiak. And, you know, for example, our philosophy of, um, well, growing up fishing, uh, you, you took only what you thought you'd be able to need for the year. And that philosophy is not really passed on in a Western society. You, you harvest, you take as much, you exploit, you make money. And the generation that's coming up is, um, has taken on more of the Western philosophy. And so what's happening, and if you look at um, a lot of the cultures across Alaska, the younger generations are asking, why are we over harvesting? How can we change this? They're going back to that traditional knowledge and trying to understand the philosophy of harvesting and sharing and what it means in terms of who we are as a people. And in that, I think, is going to be very important for the next generations to um, not only understand a philosophy, but live it. And, you know, so, for example, in Kodiak, where and well, like, for example, when I'm teaching about or talking about hunting, you know, I'm, I don't talk about, oh, let's go out and kill the animal. Well, let's go out and see what happens. Um, you know, it's based on a lot of luck, but also a lot of respect. And for me, if, if I do get an elk or a deer, I feel that the animal actually gave itself to me. And, and I, am, I am thankful in that way. And so I try to teach my nephews that, or you know, even my daughters who will be hunting for w with me, um, trying to get them to understand that philosophy and live it. Now I can only influence what's in my immediate family, but hopefully that will carry on to other families as well. Are you worried about the way Western society wastes resources, the overconsumption? I, yeah, I'm, well, I mean, if you're, you're asking about the, the wastefulness of Western resources, um, you know, I, I can get on my soapbox about fishing and, and seals and eagles. Um, over the past century, if you look at Kodiak, just as a small example, a microcosm of what's really happened, we have huge industries that come in and overexploit a resource and they move on to the next one. I don't understand why they can't sit there and regulate themselves so that they can be sustainable through generations instead of come in, over harvest something, basically destroy that ecosystem where it crashes and then they move on to the next source and do the same thing over and over and over. And if you look at it, they've gone from herring to crab to cod to salmon. I mean, it's like one thing after another. And so why can't they step back and say, hey, how can we make this sustainable for us in the long term? Uh, you know, I don't understand why it's so hard.